Welcome everybody to the show. Today, it's uh, what everybody's been talking about recently, uh, which is the jobs report came out and just how, how badly the different economists got this one wrong and where we're potentially headed. And uh, if you haven't uh, seen it already, which I'm, I doubt many of you have not seen this, but uh, we'll just go over it real quick, which is the jobs report came out. And it looks like uh, America has added a ton of jobs. Now, I don't wanna go over the specifics because you know, some people will say, well, you know, this is all about seasonality and they're, they're, they're counting part-time workers versus full-time workers, or they're talking about gig economy or whatever else. I'm just telling you that the numbers that came out, it's not looking too good for what the Federal Reserve is trying to do. What the Federal Reserve is trying to do, they're trying to raise rates to crush inflation and bring everything down. They want these, uh, the unemployment rate to actually skyrocket and go up. They want people to be out of work they don't want so many jobs to be created, and that is a problem moving forward as far as with the rates and the economy. And of course, this was for 336,000 jobs in September alone. And the economists, which I got to tell you, uh, there's like two jobs you can have and be wrong all the time and still get paid. And one of those is a weatherman. And the second one is, is an economist. And they have predicted the U.S. had added just about 170,000 jobs last month. That was the prediction. And uh, that didn't come true. They also thought the unemployment rate would come back to 3.7 or 3.6, and that didn't happen. It stuck at 3.8%. So what, what really happens is, is as time goes on and you see these negative macro indicators, and you think to yourself, okay, that's negative, so what's going to happen is that the market's going to just come back. And I said, that's going to stop raising the rates. And then, of course, the job report comes out, and you're like, what the heck? This is going to be awful. Oh, it's a bummer. And it's going to be awful. And things are going to start to, to collapse. And it's going to be bad. And this is the next big thing. And I got to tell you, there is no shortage of chicken littles as the sky is falling coming out. And I'm not saying that we're not going to see a recession. I think we are. But it just is amazing to me just how negative we really get. And of course, if we take a look at the unemployment rate <clears throat> over a Ben site here in the Cryptoverse, links in the description, First month, 10% off. Uh, we can say that, yeah, it's uh, unemployment rate was 3.8% last month. And we are here again at 3.8% this month. And nothing really changed. And I think people were freaking out in July when they said, oh, my God. And this, of course, is when, in August when it went 3.5 and actually was decreasing. And then, of course, it went up and everybody was happy. And now here we are again. And people are like, oh, this is the worst thing of all time. So what does that mean for rates? Well, if we take a look at the Fed tool, CME group. And we can just see that the next Fed meeting is the 1st of November. And right now, the federal funds rate, we're looking at between 525 and 550. So average job are in 533, whatever they, they say. <clears throat> and the probability of a Fed rate hike is now 32%. And the funny thing is, you can take a look. If you click on this, there's a link in the description for this website, by the way, if you want to check it out. If you click on historical, and you can take a look at this is the target rate probability history for the Federal Reserve meeting. And what's always interesting to me is just, is just how all over the place everybody else is and where they think things are going and what's going to actually happen. That's why I'm just not that smart. I just don't really think I can time the market perfectly or even well enough to do anything. I still believe that time in the market is more important than timing the market. And I still believe that dollar cost averaging has its place. That's just me. And you can just see like... Now, again, 525 to 550 is where we're at right now. If we're going to raise rates to 550, 575, back in two, August 15th, August, the probability of the first November rate hike was 35%. And you can see that in the uh, left-hand corner. It's kind of hard to see, and I can't really blow it up. I'm very sorry, but just trust me, that's what it says. And, of course, as time goes on, uh, we can see that that probability depending on the news that came out, depending on whatever factors that are out there, it really was pretty high, 40%. It was almost like a 55-45 like a split. This was back in September 13th. And for whatever reason, we dropped off a cliff, and, we, and everybody believed, economists included, that there's not a chance that we're going to raise anything. The probability of, of a, uh, the Fed not doing anything and just pausing again in November was almost 82% then 18% for, for a rate hike. And then, of course, we got some bad news. And then it went up to like a 70-30 split. And then, of course, just yesterday, just yesterday, October 5th. It is October 6th, right? 
Yeah. Just yesterday, it was an 80-20 split because everybody was, was like, look, when these job reports come out, it's not a big deal because we know what it's going to be. The economists are saying it's going to be this. It's going to be a slight uptick. It's not going to be a big thing. We're going to see a slight uh, reduction, <clears throat> and that's not going to happen. And what happened? Well, of course, we get a jobs report. Now everybody's like, oh, it's going to be the worst thing. I bet you this number will raise by tomorrow, maybe up to be like a 60%, 40%. But again, in the long run, who knows if the Fed's going to raise rates? Nobody absolutely knows. And I, quite honestly, I'm kind of hoping it does. So we'll see how it all works out. And then, of course, the big thing to consider, everybody, uh, treasury yields. That's what everybody says and believes is uh, a very great indicator for a recession. And I'm not going to say it's not because it's been pretty darn accurate going all the way back into the 70s. Of course, we take a look at the 10-year the and two-year spread. We can see that every time, we talked about this numerous times in the channel, every time we, there's an inversion and it goes down. And once we start to, to recoup, then we start to go into a recession. Happened in the 70s, happened again in the 80s. Over here, happened in the 90s. We see a, an inversion, everything comes back, everything's good. Everybody's like, oh, it's no big deal. And then of course we have recession. Happened in uh, the dot-com era. There was an inversion, then it uninverts. Then we have a recession. Happened in uh, 2007, the Great Recession. A little small one down here, not too bad. And then of course, very slight, very, very slight in the uh, Cervasa virus. And now here we are in 2022. And we've seen this, this is going back to June. This is a year ago. And it's been pretty darn deep. And of course, now we were coming up to the, to the spot of where it may at some point unvert. But once we get there and it rises, then we'll see a recession. So who knows when it could be? Who knows it'll be a soft landing or a hard landing? I'm not for sure. But all this, this data, all this information that we have, and, and, and we, we think we know where things are going. What does the market do? It does whatever it wants to do. Bitcoin last 24 hours up 2%, seven day 4%. Ethereum last hour 0.1, 2.3. And I, I purposely didn't do a live stream two, three, four hours ago because it was nothing but negative news. It was nothing like, okay, jobs report comes out, we're gonna see you know, a huge drop off. And actually, if you take a look at Bitcoin the last 24 hours, I think there was, yeah, here it was. And this is, this is for the rookies, you know? And if you're watching this, this video, you're not. You've been here for quite some time. And this is where people go, okay, you want to dump? All right, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. And then for the scalpers, they pick this stuff, stuff up and then boom, off it goes. What happened to the traditional markets? Same thing. You know, there was an opening, opening bell, 930, a little bit of a drop off. And they're like, we don't care. Whoop. And there it goes. Now over five days, it's actually still up. Uh, one month, of course, yeah, it's down. But six months, S&P 500 is doing quite, quite well. One year, still pretty good. Now, we're not at the all-time high, obviously, but I mean, look at this. Not too bad, although there's been a little bit of drop off and a little recovery. So for me, when I take a look at these things, I'm just like, just par for the course and um, don't really care too much. So anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then let me come up to here. So what we're just talking about, everything as far as the S&P 500, and we took a look at the different rates and stuff like that. This really does correspond to, I think, and I, I call it, it, this was one of the, this was one of the most bullish interviews I've seen. That's uh, Dan Moorhead. He is the CFO of Pantera Capital. And I just went by this piece by piece. It was about, it was about a seven minute interview, but we broke it down. And what he talks about, he's, he's talking about how massively overvalued the stock market is. Equities, he says, are, are massively overvalued 23 to 43%. And he expects a drop somewhere around there. I'm not saying it's going to definitely happen, but he's like, look, these things are super overvaluated. And then he gets into some really good things where he talks about, you know, how Bitcoin used to be correlated to the stock market or traditional markets. And it is at times, but we go through this and we take a look that, yes, it actually is uh, not correlated all the time. And it's actually hovering around the zero to 0 0.2 level, depending on the date. And we took a look at how he said, you know, it's going to be 20 years for a wild ride as, as uh, Bitcoin and mass adoption comes in. And he said something very interesting. He said, we're so very early and institutions have next to nothing as far as exposure. And it was a pretty good bullish video if you care to watch that link in the description. And then uh, that, was, that was yesterday, this morning, I put out uh, the interview 
between uh, me and, and Gary Cardone. Not Grant, Gary Cardone. I mean, Gary's a great guy. Uh, watch the video, uh, you'll see. I know people are like, is this Grant or is it, is it Gary? It's Gary Cardone. And what we talked about was the same thing. And Gary here was the VP of Natural Gas Clearinghouse, President CEO of Dynagy Europe, Fortune 30 company. And he's been investing in, in crypto slowly since 2016. And now he's really ramping things up and really getting um, uh, specific about what he's doing and really trying to, to, uh, to load up on the things that, that he wants, which is mostly Bitcoin, as he says. But what was interesting to me is that when he talked about this stuff and he said there was two things, he goes, first of all, he echoed the same thing that, that Dan Moore had said. He goes, you know, institutions and family offices, they have next to zero exposure. They're, they're starting to understand, he said, just like I understood how this all works. And he said that right now in 2023, as Bitcoin is 28,000, it's a better investment as far as risk goes than it was in 2017 at $8,000. People were asking, well, what does it mean by that? I can't speak for Gary, but I can tell you right now that to make it super simple, if we take a look at, and I've been shown this chart for like the last three days, I think it's just a brain dead, easy thing to, to, uh, to understand. If you take a look at all the asset classes, and even if we wiped out 2011, 12, and 13, which had like, you know, 2012 was 186%, but the 1400 and 5500, we wiped that out. We're still above all of the different asset classes out there over the last 10, 12, 13 years. And when, when these institutions, these family offices, and I think they're all looking at it and going, oh, okay, we get it. We just got to wait a little bit because, you know, regulatory clarity, Gary Gensler, blah, blah, blah. But when they look at this, they're like, okay, we get it. And I think once... These, it, no one wants to be like the first, but nobody wants to be last, that's for sure. And back in my day, and you know, when, when Gary was also accumulating, in 2016, 2017, we didn't have the institutions that are coming in. We didn't have uh, sitting senators, congressmen and women debating on just how big crypto and digital assets would be and the different laws that need to have as far as governance and regulation and clarity. We didn't have a uh, country using it as legal tender as El Salvador does. We didn't have the rails and everything else that we have right now in 2023. So back in 2017, it was a whole different ball game. It was a heck of a lot riskier because we didn't have all the things that were coming. Now, right now it kind of sucks because we have to go through Gary Gins with the nonsense that is. But I think when Gary talked about that in the interview and I linked in the description, it makes a lot of sense. Yes, there's less risk, but of course you're not getting at that great price level. So. I can see where things are, I think things are going, but you know, the market does what it wants to do. And I think there's a massive upside. So now talking about all that sunshine that I just showered everybody with and that great hopium, let's get a little balance because we can't just talk about the moon without talking about the rocket ship ride to get there. So I'm biased on this channel. You know that I only talk about the things that I own. And I will also talk about when there's trouble in paradise. So Polygon, I don't know if you know this, but you should be made aware that the second exec has stepped down from Polygon itself. And this is one of the uh, uh, co-founders. The other ones, uh, uh, we'll get to that in a second. So Polygon co-founder Jengti Kanani revealed on Tuesday he's been uh, stepping down. He's going to be moving on to new adventures after helping launch it, uh, Polygon in 2017. And this makes Kanani the second of 10 Polygon co-founders and the third exec to announce their third departures here. So I, I stand corrected. It was second co-founder and the third executive to actually step down. And that's really never good. You know, when we hear these things and, and of course, we always think about FTX and all the people stepping down and whatever else. So you get scared, but hold on, just wait. Maybe it's not all bad. Back in March, co-founder Adrian left the company to work on a modular blockchain spinoff the other co-founder project called Avail. Later, Polygon Labs president Ryan Watt stepped down from his role and he was replaced by the chief legal officer, Mike Mark Boyron. Polygon also remains ahead of most competitors in DeFi, boasting the fifth highest TVL compared to other networks at 794 million. However, competitors in the layer two solution of Ethereum scaling, scaling Arbitrum is beating them quite soundly with 1.7 billion TVL. And actually, I think it's even more than that. We've talked about Arbitrum a lot. Why are we talk about Arbitrum? Because <laughs> Rob owns it, that's why. So there is those things going on. And then also don't forget, 
Uh, the reason why Polygon's down roughly 80, 85 percent, I can't remember, but uh, it's not as bad as some, but still not a great year for them. And one of the reasons is because the SEC sued Coinbase in June, and they named Matic among a host of tokens that deemed to be unregistered securities. They, sure, they just named it, but they didn't bring any legal action, which is also nice. So you have the problem with being named a security, but you don't have the legal recourse to go after the SEC. Fantastic. And of course, there were others swept up in the controversy as Cardano and Solana were also named uh, in that case. Although I will say one thing about Solana. If you take a look at 2023, January to today, Solana is up pretty, pretty well, so it didn't really affect them too much. The company is now planning to transition to Polygon 2.0, interconnected network of layer two chains powered by zero knowledge tech. This transforms Polygon's current Matic token into Pole. And essentially what they're gonna do is in, instead of doing a bunch of bridges and uh, wrapping, you're just gonna be able to go through Polygon 2.0. I'm not the big tech person, so don't ask me on this one. We know it's positive, but I'll break it down at some point. But again, I want to bring this to everybody's attention that this is the third. One of two co-founders recently stepped down and also the uh, third exec, if you want to take a look at it. So maybe there's trouble in paradise, maybe there's not, but uh, that's for you to decide. And I can't give you financial advice, just thought I'd bring it to everybody's attention. Also, some other news. Uh, the bear markets hit everybody in different ways. And unfortunately, Ledger just had to cut 12% of its staff. Now, I use Ledger. And I think this is a smart move, if it is what it is, because that's how you stay lean. And that's how you survive to 2025. If you have to lay off people, nobody wants to do it. I hate doing it myself. But at some point, if things are going right, you got to do these things. But it's just a sign of the time. So, what does this mean? How many people are laid off? So the Paris-based company has 734 employees, which I was actually shocked. I'm like, that's a lot of people working for Ledger, but I'm, I guess they need them all. A 12% cut would uh, mean the elimination of roughly 88 jobs. Not too bad, but for those 88 people, I'm sure it's pretty horrible. Cuts come just months, and this is the interesting part. The cuts come just months after Ledger announced it had raised a 109 million funding round at around a $1.4 billion valuation. So take that as you will. And that's what's going on with Ledger. Now, me personally, uh, I personally have a Ledger device. I also have an Elipal, and I also have a Tangent Wallet. And one of the biggest things about Tangent Wallet, again, these are all cold storage devices. One of the things about Tangent that people uh, gave me a lot of guff about when I did my deep dive video, links in the description, affiliate link as well. You don't have to use it, but you don't get 10% off is I showed you exactly how it works, how you two or three cards, how even if the company expires and goes away that you can still access your crypto. And then of course, how to move crypto between your centralized exchanges and your cold storage device and the, and the technology behind it a little bit. And when I did this, uh, a lot of people were like, you know what, I like it, but you can't write down your mnemonic phrase because the private key is within the card itself. And people, some people didn't like it. I think it's going to be the boom for the next bull run because that's what people are used to. So for the OGs like ourselves, let's be honest, um, that wasn't available. Well, now Tantrum 2.0 is out and uh, they're allowing that to happen with their new devices that are shipped out. Not too expensive. Again, they're between, if like a two cards is like 39 bucks, three cards is like $55. So I'm not gonna go into it, but link in the description, you can check the video out. I will update that video with the new information, but I'm waiting for them to also update the app on the phone because there's more functionality and I wanna show everybody what that is. But that's available right now. The app, app upgrade, not the hard storage, the cold storage device is already upgradable and ready to go. So there is that. And then lastly for the news, <laughs> some really, I think this is, this is, this is good news. I do. And uh, <clears throat> for an ETF, again, this would be, you know, going back to a question about, you know, how safe is it or how, um, as far as risk reward compared to 2017, there was no Bitcoin ETF spot being talked about. The only one that we talked about back then was the CBOE uh, futures Bitcoin ETF, which crashed the market, which was launched on December 19th, 2017. But uh, spot ETF is going to be good. I have had my theories and thoughts about this, but uh, this came out yesterday 
or a couple of days ago, actually. And ex BlackRock director says the SEC will approve a Bitcoin ETF in three to six months. Look, I don't think it's going to be approved. But again, like I said, I'd rather be wrong and rich uh, than right and poor. So here's what we got. So the ex employee, or excuse me, uh, the ex BlackRock director, which has like nine or 10 trillion assets in our management, uh, named Schoenfield, said that he would have he would have given the industry, crypto industry, nine to 12 months before an approval of a spot ETF. But he has changed his mind because the SEC's recent decision to delay giving verdicts on several pending ETF applications is unlike previous delaying tactics by the SEC. Instead of completely rejecting the whole list, and again, there's numerous ones. There's Fidelity, there's Bitwise, there's BlackRock, and a ton of other ones that are out there. They'll probably all be, if they do get approved, they'll all be uh, all at once because only the SEC wants to give somebody first mover advantage. But they say instead of completely rejecting the whole list, they've asked for comments, which is a marginal but significant improvement in the dialogue. There's also the Grayscale lawsuit, which the SEC lost, which means they're most likely going to have to allow the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust to be converted into an ETF. And, uh, you know, Mr. Schoenfeld, I hope he's right and I hope it works out. But uh, one thing we've seen in the past uh, Gary is incredibly stubborn, and we'll see if it works out. I don't know if uh, he will do it, but uh, let's hope he does. And then, of course, uh, I have a bet going on with uh, Mr. Simon Dixon, and uh, I s told him that uh, if I don't believe it's going to be uh, approved, and I said if it is approved, I will wear an I Heart Mashinsky uh, T-shirt. Now, if it's not approved, Simon has to wear the same T-shirt, which neither of us want to do. And uh, we'll see how that works out, but I'm a man of my word and I will actually do that. But just so uh, as a reminder, uh, Simon, part of the Celsius Recovery Solution, he's announcing, uh, he's putting out three videos. One, out of the three, the first one was today. Everything you need to know about substantial emotions, everything you need to know about the Celsius crypto distribution. And then the, the third one is everything you need to know about the Celsius equity distribution. So I tweeted that out. Also, there should be a link in the description or you can go to simondixon.com uh, forward slash recovery and learn everything you need to know about the Celsius recovery. Me personally, um, you know, awful situation. I think, uh, you know, I lost, Simon lost, we all lost, it sucks. And I think uh, this case with Sam, <laughs> Scam Wakeman Freed um, is just a precursor for the Alex Mashinsky trial and we'll see how that works out. And then uh, also lastly, lastly, as a reminder, uh, still giving away the 100,000 sweat coin. That's to 20 people. We'll be giving away uh, 20,000 uh, sweat. All you gotta do is uh, follow me on Twitter, follow Sweat Economy, comment, comment below, and then fill out this form. And I'm gonna be drawing that on October 14th. And that's for the wallet that's coming to the United States on the 17th. So just as a quick re refresher, uh, they're all the uh, sweat coin with the sweat wallet. You're gonna be able to not only just, you know, get free sweat coins for walking and get all these things as far as like buying. And uh, you'll also be able to swap tokens in there. So you can't really see it, but you can get like uh, for a sweat coin, you can get the near token, near you can get for ETH, near for ETH, and then down here, it's kind of hard to see, but you got uh, Euro for sweat. So it looks like it's gonna be an on-ramp, which is pretty cool. And then also there's other different things to win that they're putting in the, uh, the wallet itself, like Amazon Prime and USDT wins and all that great stuff. Xboxes and treadmills and blah, blah, blah. And of course, how does Sweatcoin make their money? Well, they've been around for like seven, eight years. And just like, uh, just like YouTube, you get to see ads. and That's what they do, but they just give it back to their, their community instead of giving it to influencers. So that was a long stuff. A lot of things going on today, but uh, we'll see how it all plays out. Again, I don't think anybody has a crystal ball. That's why timing the market is better than timing the market. And that's it. So look. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Also, don't forget about the two videos I talked about, uh, the one with Dan Moorhead, the one with Gary Cardone. Links in the description, and it kind of just kind of sets us up for hopefully the next bull market. But that's it.